Good morning, Cannon County. How are you guys doing this morning? Good. Yeah. Hey, my name is Savut. I am the college and young adult pastor at the Experience Church in Murfreesboro. Um, and I just want to tell you briefly a little bit about myself, okay? So uh, the most important thing is I've been following Jesus for about 11 years, okay? Um, and uh, God has done so much in my life, and he's transformed me, and just so grateful for that opportunity for a relationship with him. The second uh, most important thing is I have been, we just, my wife and I just celebrated two years of marriage recently, okay? So, uh, yeah, marriage is awesome. It's such a gift to, to us, and um, after two years, she still likes me, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, and then third, I, I've been working at the Experience Church for about six and a half years, all right? And I started off in the first six months with the children's ministry, and that was such a good time. And uh, I was nervous at first. I was like, man, I don't know much about the Bible. But I'm telling you guys, as, as we start to um, live life with and teaching children about the Bible, we also learn and grow too, okay? And so watching the videos with them, um, worshiping with them, and uh, just talking to them about Jesus grew me a lot. And so I want to encourage you guys, if you're not involved, children's ministry is a great place to get plugged into as you teach them at a young age. After about six months, they asked me to consider the middle school pastor position, right? And so I stepped into middle school, and I did that for four and a half years, and I was a little nervous because, honestly, middle school is weird and awkward, right? And if you have any or if you're around anybody, you guys, you guys know that. If you're in middle school in here, I love you. Listen, I've been there for four and a half years, enjoyed my time with those families and those leaders, and just seeing them take a, a, a deep step in their faith in such a crazy culture. And then two years ago, uh, they asked me to consider the college and young adult ministry, and I absolutely love it. We've been doing that for two years. My wife and I uh, get the opportunity to do ministry together, and um, one of the perks with teaching college versus teaching middle schoolers is that when I'm teaching in college, I don't have to spend about five to ten minutes disciplining them, right? Whereas middle school, I'm like, all right, the Bible says this. I'm like, hey, can you please stop talking, right? And uh, so this morning... Three out of four services so far, they've nailed it, the first three services. And I'm hoping the 11 o'clock service, no one stands up and yells at me, okay? And so you're not chit-chatting, and I have to discipline you too, all right? So I, I, you guys are adults, and this will be a good time. Um, so enough about me. I want to talk about this community and this church here. And so um, every Monday, our three campuses, we gather together, um, and we get together, Murfreesboro, uh, Cannon County, and Shelbyville, and all of the staff gather together, and it's probably the most important thing that we do, okay? Um, we get together and we pray. We get together and we pray for about an hour together. Um, and one of the things that I love is every time, every Monday morning, um, we ask Murfreesboro, Cannon County, Shelbyville, share with us what God is doing in your, your community. Share with us some wins that God is doing. And guys, I, it's just, I'm, I'm always filled with joy when I hear about the things that's happening at our different campuses, right? And so I, I've heard so much that has happened with the Cannon County Church here. Uh, just, to, just to also see the growth, not just in numbers, but to know that there's a lot of people in this room that are hungry for the Word of God, that are hungry for a deeper relationship with Jesus. And so I want to encourage you guys that, one, you guys have an incredible team here, right? That Pastor Josh and Chad and Gina and Nicole and Adam and Noah, they absolutely love you guys, and they're committed to the mission to make authentic followers of Jesus. Like, they, they love you guys. And uh, the second thing is, it's not just them that's pouring into you guys, but you have a, a group of people in Murfreesboro and Shelbyville that's consistently praying for this community, right? They care about you, they love you, and they want you not, not just to be in these seats, but they want you to go out and then make disciples and to share the gospel. They just care so much about the community. So I hope you guys know that and you're encouraged by that, okay? So if this is your first time here, what we do uh, is we go through books of the Bible. Man, and I'm so thankful to be here this morning um, as I get to just, I've, you know, I've been talking with, with this community after every service and just hearing about their lives being changed and them finding authentic community. That's so encouraging to me. So, so to get the privilege to, to teach and share God's word with you this morning is very awesome, right? I'm, I'm so excited. And so we started this uh, unique book of, uh, called Esther, okay? And we go, we go line by line, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and uh, just preface, chapter two is a little weird, right? And I was a little nervous to teach it, but that's what we're in uh, this morning, chapter two. 
Last week, Pastor Josh taught on chapter one. And what we heard was about this king who had about this six month celebration, this festival, right? Now, now think about this, like six months of celebration. I, I don't even like being celebrated. I hate the spotlight, right? So I can't imagine six months of being in the spotlight. And that's the kind of life that he was living. And so he basically flaunted all that he owned and look at how successful I am. And that's, the, that's, that's what we saw in, in chapter one. And, and there's this awkward moment, right? He's like, hey, look at all that I own. Look at all the money I have. Look at all the success that I have right now. And then he says, hey, servants, go and get my wife. Go and get the queen, and I, I want you, I want, her, I want her to show off how beautiful she is, right? Because that's my queen, and I just want to show them off to this whole celebration. So the servants go, and they're like, hey, queen, the, the king really wants you to go show off how beautiful you are. And she says no. Now, imagine the scene. They're like, all right, the servants come back to the king, and they're like, hey, bro, she said no, Right? She said no, and obviously that makes the king really upset, and, and this just shows us something that he has everything, right, that the world offers, and yet he doesn't have his household together. He has all that, he, like, he's worried so much about this world's success that he doesn't have a good relationship with his queen and his wife, all right? And so they try to pass a law, and that's where we pick up in chapter two, right? But the question that Josh asked last week do we believe that Jesus is better than what the world is offering us? Like, at the end of the message today, I'm going to uh, quote Jesus, and Jesus says, as in Mark 8, and Jesus says, What benefit does it do for you to gain the whole world and yet lose your life? And I think that's what we saw in the king, right? He had everything that the world said was good, and yet he didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And I think that's the same issue and temptation that we may face today. The world says, this is all good. You should come and partake in it. And we give in sometimes, and we see that if without a relationship with Jesus, we're always going to be empty, okay? And that's the question we're going to ask today. Will we stand firm in our relationship with Christ, right? If we're Christians, we have this identity in Christ, or will we compromise to the culture around us? Like, do we see that today? Like, Christians living in this world, the, the culture is constantly yelling at us, saying, come and follow me. Come and do this. This is good for you. All right? So we'll be in Esther 2. Um, before we dive in, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for how amazing you are. God, I pray that you would be with our time. Uh, God, I, as I sit and I stand and, and, and I think about you, as we worship, that is such a gift to us. Let us never take that for granted, that we get to sing to you, the King of Kings, the only name that's worthy to be praised. God, as, as we open up your word this morning, remind us that that is also a gift that you've given us, that we get the privilege to read your word. Lord, I pray that you would give us all um, just an understanding of it. Give me wisdom today as I share your word. Lord, we also pray for all the churches around this community. God, would you be with those churches, be with those pastors, and be with, that, with each community that proclaims the name of Jesus. God, we love you. Thanks for loving us the way that you do. It's in Christ that we pray. Amen. Oh, I forgot to say this. When you guys walked in, you should have received the notes handout. Um, if you didn't, uh, everything I will be saying will be on the screen. And then you can also download the Experience Community app, and all my notes will be on there. Let's go to Esther 2. We're going to be in verses 1 through 11 to start off. So sometime later, when King Ahasuerus' rage had cooled down, he remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what was decided against her. The king's personal attendants suggested, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in each province of his kingdom so that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem at the fortress of Susa. Put them under the supervision of Hegai, the king's eunuch, keeper of the women, and then give them the required beauty treatments. Then the young woman who pleases the king will become queen instead of Vashti. This suggestion pleased the king, and he did accordingly. 
In the fortress of Susa, there was a Jewish man named Mordecai, son of Jer, son of uh, Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjaminite. He had been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the other captives when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon took King Jeconiah of Judah into exile. And Mordecai was the legal guardian of his cousin Hadassah, that is Esther, because she had no, other, uh, no father or mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was extremely good looking. When her father and mother died, Mordecai had adopted her as his own daughter. And when the king's command and edict became public knowledge, and when many young women were gathered at the fortress of Susa under Hegai's supervision, Esther was taken to the palace and to the supervision of Hegai, keeper of the women. And the young woman pleased him and gained his favor so that he accelerated the process of the beauty treatments and special diet that she received. He assigned seven hand-picked female servants to her from the palace, and he transferred her and her servants to the harem's best quarters. Esther did not reveal her ethnicity or her family background because Mordecai had ordered her not to make them known. Every day, Mordecai took a walk in front of the harem's courtyard to learn how Esther was doing and to see what was happening to her. So a lot going on here, but what we saw in chapter 1 is there's this law that gets passed, right? Because what happens is the woman said no, and so they're pretty upset. They passed this decree, this law, for women now to honor their husbands, right? So just think about that. That's really stupid, right? But, but I think we kind of think the same way. We're like, okay, the world is, is, is chaos right now, right? People are committing crimes. People are doing some crazy, ridiculous stuff, and they're headed towards destruction, I know what to do. Let's vote and let's pass some laws. Let's bank on laws changing people, right? And, and we see the story of the Bible and, and the story of our lives that only God can change uh, the man's heart, right? So we don't need more laws. We need heart change. We need people to know that without God, they're going to head towards destruction, right? And so what we see here is, you know, we don't hear much more about Vashai. Some commentators think that, um, they, the, that the king got her killed, right? So we don't know. She disappears, but the king, after about four years, so four years have passed from chapter one, now to chapter two. And also in this time, he's going to war against Greece and he's getting his butt kicked, right? So he's finally home and he's like, he realizes, man, I, I miss having a wife. Right? He probably misses that companionship. And so here is a man, and this is, you know, Pastor Josh talked about this last week. This, this guy looks like he has it all together, but right now we see all he could think about is what he doesn't have. Right? And he thinks like a, a, a spouse will, uh, this queen will fulfill him, but truthfully, we know that only God can fulfill all of our needs, right? And so the king's personal attendants, they're like, hey, listen, man, I know you're sad. We, we love you, and, and it's all about you. We got a great plan. What if we have a search made for beautiful young virgins for the king, right? And then thousands of young, you know, some commentators think there are thousands of women that were gathered and then they would come into the harem, and then whoever pleases you, you can pick as the next queen. Now, when I read this, I think of The Bachelor, right? If you've ever seen that, it's kind of what it is. It's like, oh, this, like, they, they, they need to find a spouse, so let's have these beautiful women gathered up, and then you get to go on dates, and you figure out who you want to marry, okay? Now, the question that I have for us, because we see the life of the king that he's living right now, is do we surround ourselves with people who point us to God or to ourselves, and when I think about my own life, um, so I have an addictive personality, okay? And when I first became a Christian, um, I was addicted to uh, two things. I was addicted to video games, right? Something I was good at, and then I was also addicted to pornography, something I ran to, okay? And so when life gets difficult, when life gets overwhelming, when I'm stressed, when family life is falling apart, um, what I do is I run to these two things, and I'm in the church, and so I'm in community, correct? And so when I'm in community, I, I, and maybe we've all done this, in those seasons when life is hard, what I will do is I will look for people that will tell me exactly what I want to hear. So what I'll do is I'm going to go find some surface-level Christians that don't know about my past, and I'm going to say, hey, man, life is just so difficult right now. I'm so stressed right now. Man, I'm playing a lot of video games. I just need your prayers, right? And they'll say, video games are a great outlet. And, like, nothing wrong with that, but for me, it was a sin that I ran to, okay? 
Second thing, this is, uh, this is worse, right? So, so in, I started talking to people about pornography. I was like, hey, man, I'm, I'm really trying pornography. And the response I got was so sad. And it said, they, they had, I found men that would tell me, that's just what men do, right? Or that's normal. Christians, all Christians struggle with it. And can I say something, guys? That, like, if, if someone tells you that, that that's just what men do or that's just what women do, that's bull crap, right? Because, listen, if we have a relationship with God, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, right? And the Holy Spirit is, is able to do far more than we can ever imagine. And so don't believe the lie that there's no way out, that there is no hope. And I remember I believed that lie for the first four years of my life as a Christian. And I would believe this lie that, man, I'm just going to wrestle with this for the rest of my life. And I remember I had a mentor that walked with me that said, I believe one day, one day you will find freedom Continue to run to the Lord. I'm going to pray with you, and I'm going to walk with you, but I believe one day you will find freedom from this. There is hope. Hold on to that. And guys, I, I want to share with you, like, for six years now, I've been free, right? I've, I found freedom, and I want to encourage you guys that that same freedom is offered to you, that you can find freedom. There is hope. Hold on to that. And if we surround ourselves with people that point us to God, what will happen is the old, our old self, the old life will be put to death. That's what scripture says, put to death your old way of living. We are a new creation, right? And what we see in the king's life, he surrounds himself with people that will tell him exactly what he wants. And that's the danger that we can get into also. So Mordecai, we see uh, he adopts uh, Esther, right? So when her parents died, he kind of he took her in. And so he is about probably a little bit over 100, and Esther is about 14, right? And so he takes, he takes her in and treats her like a daughter. And like many Jews in captivity, Esther had both a Jewish name and a Gentile name. And this is probably the author's way of letting us know that, man, there's, here's this young woman, and she's trying to live in two worlds, right? She has this Jewish background, and now she's going to get into this mess with the Persian culture. I think we also live in the same place, right? In, in the same settings. If we think about our lives as Christians, we are going against the pressure of culture daily. Culture is screaming at us. It's wanting our attention. It's wanting us to follow the ways of what culture says is good. Christians, we are called to be in this world, right? Like that's, we are in this world, but not of this world. And what I mean by that, there's two extremes. I think one extreme, we're like, all right, I'm in this world, but I'm going to not be around anyone that doesn't think like me, doesn't look like me. I'm going to remain in my Christian bubble. And that's not the life that God calls us in, right? We don't need to remain in our Christian bubbles. And, but the other extreme is, all right, I'm so excited to share the gospel, and I'm just going to go do it and not actually depend on God at all. I'm not actually going to hold on to the word. I'm going to do what I think is best. And when we do life, when we share the gospel without a relationship with God, we're going to compromise to the world. We're going to start to give in. You know what? I know the Bible says this, but this is more popular, so I'm going to do this instead. All right, I'm going to start to look just like the world. Our pastor says it a lot, Pastor Corey. He says, we need to be insulated with the Holy Spirit, right? Not isolated from the world. And when we are insulated, when we depend on the Spirit and hold on to His Word, then we can go and be sheep among wolves, right? We can go and be the salt and the light that God calls us to be. Romans 12 says this, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. In this world, but not of this world, Christians. So the harem life, right? This, this chapter's a little weird, and what we see here is women are taken out of their homes at a young age against their will and against their family wishes and they never will go back to normal life. Each girl, they would go through this 12-month beautification process before the king even considered her. So there's some commentaries I read that thousands were gathered, but then maybe only 400 made the cut because of how they looked, right? And then what would happen then is they would each have one night to please the king, and out of the 400 or so, one would be chosen as queen. It's a sick scene here. It's a sad life that is going on with these women. And then the rest will spend the rest of their lives, right? If they're not chosen as queen, they're going to spend the rest of their lives secluded in this harem, right? The harem is basically the section where sex trafficking happens, right? That's basically kind of what it is to the modern day. 
And then we hear about the two names. You saw Hadassah, and then it says parentheses. This is Esther. So the passive verb that we see with Esther is Esther was taken. This just implies that she's put in a very difficult situation. Seems like it's out of her control, right? She is taken, thrown into the palace. One minute she's Hadassah growing up in a Jewish home. The next minute she is taken and thrown into the palace where her only hope, okay, listen, her only hope seems to be for her to immerse herself into the Persian culture and to become this new identity. That's what we see here. Now, the last, the last thing that we see in the section is Mordecai's interesting command. He says, hey, hey, Esther, don't tell about your family background. Don't share about your faith. Don't share any of that. Now, maybe perhaps, as I was thinking, and it's not clear, like, why would he say that and why would she do this? I don't know. But maybe Mordecai is thinking the best life that she can have is probably to become queen, right? So maybe this would diminish her chance to become queen if she shares about this. Mordecai, I know he cared for her because each day he would walk back and forth to check up on her, right? So that's what we see in this scene. Now let's go to the next part. We're going to go to verse 12. And during the year before each young woman's turn to go to King Ahasuerus, the harem regulation required her to receive beauty treatments with oil of myrrh for six months and then with perfumes and cosmetics for another six months. And when the young woman would go to the king... She was given whatever she requested to take with her from the harem to the palace. And she would go in the evening, and in the morning, she would return to a second harem under the supervision of the king's eunuch, Sheazgaz, keeper of the concubines. She never went to the king again unless he desired her and summoned her by name. Esther was a daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had adopted her as his own daughter. And when her turn came to go to the king, she did not ask for anything except what he guy, the king's eunuch, keeper of the women, suggested. Esther gained favor in the eyes of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Ahasuerus in the palace in the tenth month, the month of Tebeth, the month, or in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther more than all the other women. She won more favor and approval from him than did any of the other virgins. He placed the royal crown on her head, and he made her queen in place of Vashti. And the king held a great banquet for all his officials and staff. It was Esther's banquet. He freed his provinces from tax payments and gave gifts worthy of the king's bounty." And so hundreds of women would spend a night with the king, and and this is so sad. They're only evaluated by their outward appearance, right? So their physical beauty and their sexual performance. And as I read that, I'm like, how can the king do such a thing like this? And I think we can ask the same question. We can say, how could anyone do this? And here's the answer. I think we can all fall in the same trap. When we live a self-centered life and when we dabble in sin and say it's no big deal, well, sin will eventually give birth to death. So if we don't get a grip of whatever sin that we are committing, whatever that is, right? In secrecy, we're like, it doesn't affect anybody, right? Let's just talk about sexual sin. That, I, this is what this, this passage is talking about, right? We see a lot of sexual sin here. If we don't get a grip on sexual sin, it's eventually going to destroy you. It's eventually going to destroy the marriage and the kids involved and the other person's marriage, right? It's going to get out of control. Same thing with lying, same thing with bitterness and anger. If we don't get a grip of that, if we don't ask God to free us and help us, it's going to destroy somebody. It's going to hurt somebody, and eventually it's going to destroy our entire lives. And so we have to ask this question, is do we have authentic accountability? As we gather every Sunday, and, and we talk about, and we go, we go to worship, and we listen to the word, what we can do is we can start to see familiar faces, right? We can sit next to certain people, Um, And then what can happen is maybe that family or that individual starts to disappear. Maybe they start to have such a hard time in life where they start to isolate. And I think the initial response for us is like we're concerned about them, but it's also maybe some of us, and I've been there, we point fingers and say, I knew they weren't going to last. Of course, why why are they not here? We start to judge them, right? And we need to take this small step to say, man, 
I need to pray for that person. I need to get to know them. I need to reach out to them, and I'm going to call them, and I'm going to see, hey, man, I haven't seen you in church in a while. How are you doing? And take it to the next step then. We don't just call them, and, and, and we say, hey, I want to get lunch with you, and I want to sit down with you. Let's just get to know each other more. And then once we know people, guys, what will happen is we will start to see people's flaws, and, and that's, that's okay because we all have flaws. We all have blind spots, right? And so what we need is we need people to point out our blind spots, and to say, hey, I love you so much, and this direction you're going is going to end up hurting you, right? It's not good for you. Not only that, I think it's easy for us to point out flaws. I think this is the hard part. And, and imagine if this community got to that place. We see something in our friend or, our, or you know, our brother or sister that we really love, and we're going to call it out. But then we'll say, hey, man, I see it, and I'm going to step in the mess with you. I'm going to walk life with you side by side. And I'm going to be here for you, whatever you need. I'm here for you. Sometimes we get to this place where we're like, man, I, I don't want to call out people's sin or I don't want to, to point out where they're messing up or because I'm afraid what they might think. But here's from my experience. Initially, it sucks when people call, call stuff out of me, right? When people call out the blind spots in my life, it's painful. Like we've been there. It hurts. But a week later or the next day, we're going to be so grateful, right? Oh, man, I'm so glad that you called this out of me. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for loving me. And that's where we have to get to, right? We have to have authentic accountability because if we don't, sin will eventually give birth to death. Guys, we need to love our brothers and sisters so much that we will walk with them in the mess. And I think about Jesus, right? Jesus did that with us. He knows everything about you. He knows everything about me. We were headed towards destruction, and he rescued us. He walks with us in the mess and he saves us. And we can do the same thing with others, introduce them to a relationship with Christ. We can read this section and we can say, man, what an insane culture, right? Uh, Esther was a young girl and she conformed to the Persian culture. The king was a man driven by his own appetites. We see these two extremes here. And I think what we're seeing in this chapter is the United States today. And, and I get it. Uh, we are the United States of America, one nation under God. I get that. And we live in the Bible belt, right? There's no way that's our culture. But if, if we're denying that, we're not looking around. We're not actually living in life, right? We're just in this Christian bubble. Like, go out, like, turn the TV on. Watch the news. Watch media. Watch movies. Listen to the music that, that this culture puts out. It's sick, right? And I'll start with myself, guys. When I remove God from the equation of my life and I start to push him away, I become driven by my own appetite. Um, when, you know, when we have the spirit living inside of us, the spirit wages war with the flesh, right? It wages war with the flesh. And when we push the spirit away and we're like, hey, I don't, I don't really want to talk with God. I don't really want to read his word. I don't want to, to feed myself with the word of God. What's going to start to happen is we will start to follow our feelings, like, a life following our feelings leads to stupid decisions, right? right? It, we, it leads to us saying really dumb things. And, and so we have to understand, I need to depend on the Spirit, right? I need to not remove God from the equation. And when our culture does that, what happens is we start to devalue humans. We start to look at people as just objects. We forget that everybody, I don't care what they look like, I don't care what they sound like, I don't care what they believe in, everybody is made in the image of God, and if you're like, man, but I actually don't really like some people. I, like, people are hard to love, right? I have to be in my life. It's hard to love. But guess what? We are also probably hard to love, and yet God is fierce with us. God loves us. God pursues us. God chases after us. And this is something that our, that our pastor, Pastor Corey, models well. This is something that I've learned from him. Uh, and this is something that I think we all should start doing, guys. If you have a hard time loving certain people, Here's what you can do. Lord, break my heart, soften my heart, show me how to love people. Give me a heart to love people. Help me see everybody made in the image of God. And that will change our perspective. It will change how we live life here on earth. And so Esther here, listen guys, when, when some commentators look at it and it's like, hey, she looks like she's humble. You know, she looks like, um, because she says, hey, I, he guy, I will take whatever you think is best. I'm going to take a different approach. And some think that she actually knows the rules of the competition and she's going to do whatever it takes to become the queen, right? We, we don't know, but there's, there's two different sides here. 
So Esther, she embraced the values of the empire, and then she becomes queen. That's what we see in the next part. So about four years have passed. She gets crowned queen, and the next, from chapter 3 on, she's referred to as Queen Esther. She's the new queen. The banquet, just like, unlike the, you know, chapter 1, that first banquet was all about the king, right? This second banquet now is all about his queen. And as I read this chapter, guys, uh, it's, I was wrestling with it. I talked to my wife. I was like, man, I don't really know which direction to go. And, and I, I'm, not, I'm not here to try to bash Esther. Uh, she was put in a difficult situation. She was listening to Mordecai, right? That's a, that's a difficult circumstance that she's in. I get that. Um, but I also don't want to elevate her as his role model, right? When, when I look at chapter two, like I'm not going to tell my daughters and, and my sisters and, and people in this world that, hey, if you want to be a godly woman, go read just chapter two of Esther, right? That's, that's crazy. We don't want to do that. But thankfully, the book, chap, it, and, and, uh, Esther doesn't end in chapter two, right? It keeps going because if Esther ended in chapter two, I don't think this would be in the Bible. But God continues to pursue her, right? God continues to pursue her. And so there's speculation. It's not very clear here. Maybe she hated her circumstance. That's what I think. And maybe she wondered how God could have let such a horrible thing happen to her, right? I've been there. When something happens, I'm like, Lord, where are you at? Or Lord, why would you allow this? This is crazy. But on the other hand, maybe she loved life in the harem. Maybe she enjoyed being with the most powerful man in the empire, right? I don't know, but here's what I do know. This is a morally ambiguous and difficult situation. And this reminds me, it's because, like, this is real life stuff, guys. This is real life stuff, and we deal with the same mess in our lives. And you know why? Because sin entered the world, and it fractured our relationship with God. And sin also fractured our relationship with other people. And so sometimes life gets messy. Sometimes we respond in the wrong way, and sometimes we respond in ways that honor God, right? But thankfully, just like Esther, God is gracious, and he continues to pursue us. All right? Praise God for that. So this last part here, guys, it's just going to set up the rest of the book, okay? But it's important because we need to know what happens here in the next, in this last section in chapter 2. Let's go to verse 19. And so when the virgins were gathered a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not revealed her family background or her ethnicity as Mordecai had directed. And she obeyed Mordecai's orders as she always had while he raised her. And during those days, while Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the entrance, they became infuriated and planned to assassinate the king. And when Mordecai learned of the plot, he reported it to Queen Esther, and she told the king on Mordecai's behalf. When the report was investigated and verified, both men were hanged on the gallows. And this event was recorded in the historical record in the king's presence. So the first thing we see in verse 19, and, and we can miss it if we just kind of read quickly, right? Esther is already queen. She was crowned queen. She had this banquet for her. And the first thing we see is for a second time, young virgins were gathered. There was no reason to gather women for a second time. But this just shows us the promiscuous lifestyle of the king. This shows us what life is like when we are driven by our own appetites. We're always going to want more, and us wanting more and the world feeding us more will never fully satisfy us. But the important information in this section is Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. That's the important detail here, right? So Mordecai wasn't just hanging around. He had this administrative role. So he had access to the queen and all the other workers here. It mentions Esther's family background one more time, right? And, and it says in parentheses. So this is important for a reason. She continued to hide her nationality and her faith, just like Mordecai told her to. The king and everyone around didn't know of her, fa of her family background and also didn't know her relationship to Mordecai. So she, yes, yeah, she is queen of Persia, but she continued to submit to Mordecai. And, and the last part here is Mordecai, because he's always around, he's there, he's been a lot of time there. He overhears of this plot, right? These two guys are mad about something, and they got this plan, and he overhears it, and he goes, hey, we're going to assassinate the king. So Mordecai's like, oh, I'm going to go tell the queen. Tells the queen, right, hey, queen, listen, there, 
they're just trying to kill your king, man. You like you got to do something about it. So she reports it, and she and she does it, like she knows what she's doing, right? She's like, okay, we don't know each other, right? Remember that. Hey, Mordecai, that Mordecai guy, he said that somebody's trying to kill you. You guys should check that out. So they verify it, and then they they investigate it, verify it, and then they kill those two guys. The important detail here is the integrity of both Mordecai and Esther was now established with the king. And that's going to set up the rest of Esther. Now, this chapter is finished, and we're like, okay, what, what does this mean for our lives? What does that look like? Um, what can we take out of this? So the first thing is how many of us, like Esther, all right, Esther and Mordecai, difficult situation. How many of us, like Esther, have concealed our faith in order to avoid being uncomfortable? Like, like think about that in your jobs, in, in your school, um, in your neighborhoods, in public. Maybe you're at a, a family gathering. Like, think about this. And I'll be transparent with you guys. The first three years of me being a Christian, right, I was the only believer in my family. And at church, I love being a Christian, right? Isn't that easy, right? We love being a Christian at church. Uh, when I'm serving, of course, I'm a Christian. But man, uh, every time I went to, my, to, to, to a family gathering to see my parents, to see my siblings, um, every time I would make that drive to Nashville, I would say, all right, God, I want to take a break from you, okay? And what I would do is I would go back to my old life. I would go back to talking like I used to talk, doing the things that I used to do with my family, because that was the easy thing to do, right? I, I needed to just fit right in my family, because this is family. This is what it means to be family, right? And I remember after three years of living this, like, double life and this secret to life, like, I, would, I, would, I was ashamed of God and who I was in God. God made it so clear to me, and this is what God said to me, Savut, you are my child. You are a new creation, I love you. I am your king. Right? All those things just were so clear to me. And then embrace your new identity in me. So I remember from that point on, I would, anytime I would go see my family on that drive to Nashville, what I would do then is I would intentionally pray and I said, Lord, I need your help. I have no idea how to stand firm in you. I, I don't know what that looks like to, to, to be a Christ follower in the midst of non believers. I don't know what that looks like. Lord, show me how to do that. And then I started to pray, Lord, just give me an opportunity to be the salt and the light that you called me to be. I need your help. And guys, like praying that, intentionally praying for my family, uh, I'm just so excited to, to praise God for what he's done. Now in my life today, there's six believers in my family, right? So six people in my family have come to know the Lord just because there's a simple, like I'm embracing this new identity in Christ everywhere, not just at church. And I think and I want, to, I want to tell a story to encourage you guys because the truth is God can do the exact same thing with you, right? Like at your jobs, in your homes, at your school, wherever you are at, sometimes we just think that people are too far gone. Some pe sometimes we think that there is no hope for them to ever come to know the Lord. Like I thought that with my family and the Lord has shown me differently. And I think like we have forgotten that the Lord still performs miracles, Right? That he's still that good that he can bring people from spiritually dead to spiritually alive. And he can use you. So like the way that you live, the way that we live everywhere, like even on the road when you're mad, right? I'm, I'm so bad about that. Like I have road rage and I don't represent Christ. So if you see me, forgive me. But the thing is, people are watching all the time. And one day, you know, I think about the, the, the song, the Firm Foundation song. It's, I've still got joy and chaos, Right? I've got peace that makes no sense. Like when we live like that in this culture, people are going to start to see that you are, you are different. And they'll say, what, how do you respond like that? You know what we can say? Jesus Christ, a relationship with him is the only way that I can respond and have joy and chaos. How many of us are, uh, we can steal our faith because we're afraid to lose a friendship? Let's take it a step further or a family member. Um, my wife and I are walking to do that right now, uh, standing firm with what we believe, what this word says. And we've lost family, we've lost friends. Um, and that's painful, guys. Maybe you've experienced that. It's painful when you stand firm for Christ. It's hard. But what we can do now is we intentionally pray for that person. We don't give up on them. We continue to pray for them. And here's the good news. I don't have to share the gospel with my family all the time. And you don't have to share the gospel with your family all the time because you're not their savior, Right? <laughs> The good news is we're, we're thankful for the church and the community of believers because we just need to pray that God gets their attention somehow, that somebody steps in to love them where they're at 
Okay? So that's what we need to do. Start to pray for those bridges that we feel like this burn and there's no chance. The next question I have is, do we conform to the world just to gain more of it? You know, I think about the business world, right? If you've been in the business world, maybe you've heard your boss or someone offer, hey, if you do this, if you do this shortcut, just take this shortcut, man, you can climb this ladder and get paid this much more. That temptation is strong, and we will do it because we want more of the world. So we will conform to the culture, right? I hope no one's watching. I'm going to do this. I know this is not morally correct. I know this is not biblical, but I'm going to do it because I want more of the world. Here's what I want to say, guys. Church, we need to stop relying on money and looks and intellect and worldly success. You know why? Because money, looks, intellect, and worldly success, that all of those things will all fade away at the end of our lives. Like when Christ returns or when we die, all of that will fade away except our firm foundation in relationship with Jesus. That's what matters, and that's why we need to hold on to that hope. And so despite Esther's and Mordecai's compromise and what we see here, God did not give up on her. God pursued her, and he used her to deliver his people. Right? That's a spoiler alert. You don't need to read your rest Esther. That's what happens in the rest of Esther. <laughs> Sorry, Josh. So, but this is the story of the Bible, right? Abraham lied to protect his wife. Moses murdered someone. David slept with another man's wife and then had him killed. Peter denied Jesus three times. An interesting thing about, interesting thing about Peter, denied Christ three times, and yet Christ uses him to start the church. Paul persecuted the church, and God uses him to write all the New Testament. Like, what we see with all these guys and these people it's that God did not give up on them. God continues to pursue them. His grace is incredible. And that's the same story of our lives too, right? Like we look at these people and we're like, man, of course, they're heroes of the Bible. Like, sure, but they were unlikely people. And that's the same story for all of us. We are unlikely people, but God wants to use you. God wants to use this community to go and be the salt and the light. We're going to mess up. And if we will repent and run back to God and say, God, I need your help. It's all about you. He can use us. His grace is amazing, and his love is fierce. God is that good. What we see is all these people may have compromised or made the wrong decisions, um, except for Christ. Christ lived a perfect life. Think about him in the wilderness when Satan tempted him three times, right? There has, been, there has never been more greater temptation than what Christ faced. He understands everything that we go through, right? He knows the details of our lives. He knows what we walk through. He's been there. But unlike Esther and unlike us, Jesus says no. All right, praise God for that, that Christ stood firm and says, I am here to do the Father's will, and their Father's will is that no one should perish. Like, he knew that we needed a Savior because of the perfect life he lived. Christ is the only one that could get on the cross to die for us. And because of that, we have that opportunity to have a genuine, authentic relationship with him. And so, church, we're going to face many temptations. We've already faced probably many temptations where identifying as a Christian isn't popular. It isn't easy. It isn't the cool thing to do. Um, and there, there are, there's going to be times where it's going to cost us our lives. And I think other parts of the world, we, we see that, <clears throat> we hear about it. I don't think we've experienced that yet in the United States but maybe soon we will. I don't know. But here's what I do know is the people that stand firm for their faith and they, they, they die um, for their faith, the reason why they do that is because they know they get Jesus in the next life. And, and I think like for us, we can say that, but when the pressure hits, sometimes we give in. But man, imagine, imagine if we were a church that said, I don't care what happens, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Like, we should have a healthy longing for heaven, right? We should say, man, I'm so excited to be with Christ for eternity one day because then, man, I get to just, like, being with him is all that matters. Being with Christ in the presence of Christ is all that matters. One day there will be no tear, no sadness, no, 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 no heartache, none of that perfect life with Christ forever. That's what we should look forward to. And so the, the, the most important questions we're going to ask today is do we have an authentic relationship with God? Our mission here is to make authentic followers of Jesus. I've already told you guys that, that you guys have an incredible team of staff here. Josh and his team love you guys fiercely. 
They love you guys. They, they, they don't care about the numbers and the seats. They care about your souls. They don't care if people just come to church all the time. Like, that's, that's great. That's awesome. People are hearing the gospel, but they care that you have a genuine and real relationship with Jesus. I'm afraid that what will happen to some North American Christians is that we'll get so caught up into just going to church and thinking that's all that matters. Like, I need to go to church. I need to get involved in life groups. I need to go serve. Like, those are all important things. But, man, if we go home and we disconnect and we never talk to God on our own personal time, we've missed the point. I think what will happen is what Christ talks about is at the end of our lives when Christ returns, some people will say, Lord, I did all these things in your name. And Christ says, depart from me. I never knew you. Like, that's what we don't want to happen to our community and to our church. That's why we share the gospel, but we don't want to just tell them it's all about going. Like, going to church is great, it's important, it's necessary, but get real. This is not a game. Get real with our relationship with God. Do we have authentic community? Do we have people that will point us to Christ, that will call out the blind spots in our lives, that will challenge us and hold us accountable? And when life gets difficult, guys, um, for some of us, we've already gone through some storms. And if you're, you say, man, life has been pretty easy, uh, the truth is life's going to get hard. It, it will get difficult. You will come through, you know, you'll, you'll go through a storm. How are we going to respond? Are we going to compromise or are we going to respond and worship? You know, I, I was talking to a college student a few weeks ago. It's, about, it's been about six months since his father passed away. And he's just been consistent. He's been, he's been excited for the word. And, and so I just asked him. I was like, man, I haven't lost uh, my, my parents, you know, praise God for that. And, and I haven't lost, like, close family members yet in my life. But I asked him, I said, hey, how, how are you able, like, man, how, how are you doing with your dad? Kind of say the situation with your dad. And, and his response blew me away. Um, and he just said, Savut, I have no idea how people do it without God. I have no idea how people do it without God. And guys, like, that's the same truth for us. Like, think about it. If we have a relationship with God, aren't we so grateful that God is with us in the mess, that God is with us in the storm, that he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm not going anywhere. I'm here for you. And that's why we're able to endure the hard times. And so every, it doesn't matter what we go through, guys, we will always have a, a, an opportunity to respond in worship, to honor God. Esther's story is difficult, man. We, we see that here. And sometimes life and circumstances in our, in our own lives can, can look crazy. It can look hopeless. And, and I've been there. I'm like, man, there's no way out. There's no way except to do this one thing. And that's not true. You know, in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes about it. God is faithful. God is faithful. He will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. When we are tempted, he always provides a way out. That's good news for us. God is faithful. That's what I want us to hear this morning as a church. God is faithful. Here's the good news, even when we're not, right? God is that good. Imagine that, like God is faithful even when we're not. But church, when and if we rely and depend on God, he will provide a way out. There's a way out. It's going to be countercultural, right? It's not gonna be like the world's ways to respond to things. Sometimes it's gonna be painful, but it's always worth it to look at Christ as your king. The last thing I'll say is what Jesus says in Mark, guys. If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself. The first thing we see is we need to, we need to deny ourselves and our flesh. Like, that means life is not about you. <laughs> that means life's not about me. Life's not about us. Deny ourselves, and then we take up our cross, and we follow him. For what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world and yet lose his life? Man, that's what we saw with the king in chapter 1. Had everything that the world says was good. Doesn't have a relationship with God. And, and I think the danger, the temptation that we face in our culture, the culture is yelling at us. And some of us will give in and we will want everything that the world says is good because it feels good right now. What benefit does that do, church? for us to gain the whole world and yet don't have a relationship with God. We won't just lose our life here on earth. We're going to lose our life in the next life too. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man 
will also be ashamed of him when he comes. Everywhere we go, are we ashamed of who we are in Christ? Will we stand firm in our identity in Christ, or, 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 or are we going to compromise and give in to the culture around us? You guys bow your heads. Um, let's go to God in prayer.